This unassuming box is a video game console that you actually can't play. Well, at least not on its own. It's called the Pack n one which is just one of several modules made for the Laser Active, which is a sort of combination Laserdisc player slash video game console that's absolutely massive and one of the most superfluous and opulent gaming machines of the 90s. By inserting the Pack n one into the Laser Active, I'm able to play PC Engine titles, as well as Super CD-ROM and LD-ROM games, which are stored on these massive Laserdiscs. Longtime viewers of the channel know that I absolutely love obscure retro gaming tech like the Laser Active, which I actually completely refurbished over a few live streams a couple years ago. I also refurbished the Sega Genesis equivalent of the Pack n one called the Pack s 10 now, like many consoles of this generation, the old electrolytic capacitors are starting to reach their end of life. And in the case of this Pack n one preemptively replacing them is basically a requirement now. It's so necessary, in fact, that according to Zaxor, one of the most knowledgeable laser active gurus out there, if you acquire one of these, you shouldn't even bother inserting it into the laser active until you replace all the capacitors. And that's because there is a high probability that a leaky capacitor can actually cause a short on the power rails, blowing one or more of the fuses on the laser active's power supply. So that's just what I'm going to be doing in today's video. Replace all the electrolytic caps, and during that process, showcase five ways you can remove these pesky surface mounted capacitors with some methods I like and others that I don't equipping you with the knowledge to tackle this task yourself. I'll of course be using a capacitor kit that I got from console 5, which is pretty much my go-to for these types of jobs. So sit back, relax, and let's get this ultra rare pack in one in tip top running condition. <laughs> All right, as usual, we're gonna start off by tearing the N1 down to the motherboard, and it's actually super simple. The outer metal shell is held on with a few security bits, and the motherboard inside with just a few JIS screws. So let's crack her open. Now, while we're doing that, an interesting thing about these game packs and the Laser Active in general is just how expensive they were when they were released back in 1993. The Laser Active Player retailed for roughly $970 back then, which is the equivalent of about $2,100 nowadays when adjusted for inflation. Now keep in mind, that doesn't include the cost of the gaming module like this pack and one that we're refurbishing. If you wanted to buy the Sega or PC Engine game pack, that would be an extra $600, or again, when adjusted for inflation, just shy of $1,300. So, all in, if you wanted to play the PC Engine in one of the most expensive ways possible back in the 90s, you would have to pay a hefty sum of $3,400, which is absolutely insane. This definitely must have been targeted to those with large amounts of disposable income, since simply getting a regular standalone console and the Laserdisc player would have been significantly cheaper. It's really crazy to think just how expensive these were. Anyway, taking a look at the motherboard, I have to say that it's in shockingly good condition. It looks very clean, and there's no immediately noticeable signs of damage caused by leaky capacitors, which is great news. Here you can see the three Hudson chips, which makes this a PC engine, as well as the beefy NEC chip, which is for CD-ROM game support, and this Pioneer chip, which allows the game pack to interface with the laser active system. Taking a closer look at some of the caps, like I mentioned earlier, many look to be in good condition. However, there are also quite a few that show some signs of corrosion on the leads, which is a sign of leaky electrolytic fluid. We caught these early, so there doesn't appear to be much damage at all. And here are some more caps that again show some signs of corrosion. Okay, so now that we've sort of assessed the situation, let's start the process of removing all the electrolytic capacitors. To do this, you'll want to add a good amount of flux, which will help eat up some of that corrosion and aid in their removal. You'll also want to add some fresh solder to the leads, which again will help in the removal process. Now, like I said earlier, I'm going to show you five different ways to remove these surface mounted capacitors so that no matter which tools you have, you'll be successful in their removal. The first one is what I call the rocker method. What you'll need to do is heat one of the leads and then tilt the capacitor gently in the opposite direction. This will ever so slightly lift the cap's leg off the pad. 
Be careful not to use too much force as you do not want to put too much pressure on the pad and risk damaging or lifting it. Then do the same on the other side and then back on the other. Keep alternating sides until the capacitor is eventually removed. Again, the key thing to remember with this style of removal is to take your time. Don't put too much pressure when tilting the cap and ensure that the solder is melted prior to tilting. Follow these steps and you should be able to remove the surface mounted capacitor just like that. Then clean the area with some isopropyl alcohol, remove the residual solder with some wick, and then clean it again to be left with some fresh pads that are ready to accept a brand new capacitor. Now this next method of removal is a bit controversial, but I find that it works pretty well and have had good luck with it. It involves using flush cutters. Now what we can do is cut the aluminum can near the base, but we need to cut parallel to the leads as shown here. The idea is to put as little stress on the leads as possible, thereby reducing tension on the pads. I place my spudger on top to place some downward pressure as well as prevent the can from flying across the room. Once it's cut off, remove the bottom part of the can as shown. And then trim the top part of the leads as this will help allow us to remove the plastic base below. Now apply some flux as well as some fresh solder to whisk away the remaining part of the capacitor legs from the pads. Then again, clean the area and then use some wick to remove the old solder from the pads. Now this next method involves hot air and is probably one of the least risky ways to remove surface mounted components. I like to add some fresh solder to the leads prior to hitting it with hot air. While temperature and flow rate depends on the application, I was using a medium flow at around 400 degrees Celsius. While heating the area evenly, I gently hold the capacitor, waiting until the solder melts so that I can lift it off. Now you'll notice that there is some red stuff in between the pads. This is actually glue that was used during the assembly process to hold the capacitors in place. Unfortunately, since many of the caps are held on like this, it makes using hot air rather difficult since it holds the base down even though the solder is melted, so I actually won't be using this method to remove the other capacitors. And if you have a desoldering gun, you can use that to remove the residual solder from the pads instead of solder wick. It's a great tool to have and this also helps the process go a lot quicker. Okay, this next method I'm not really a fan of and actually never used it since I'm just too afraid it will lift the pads and that's the twisting method. I've seen this method used quite a bit online and I think it can be fine if you're confident in the strength of the pads, but I would exhaust all other methods first before using this one. Okay, the last method I'm gonna show you is actually my favorite. I again add solder to both the leads, but this time to remove it, I use an amazing tool called hot tweezers. It's kind of like having two soldering irons attached to each other, allowing you to heat both leads at the same time. It makes removing surface mounted components like these capacitors super easy. However, again, since many of these capacitors are also glued to the PCB substrate, you can run into issues kind of like this. Here, let's take a look at that again in slow motion. Yeah, you see the hot tweezers worked and I pulled the capacitor off, but it was giving me such a hard time because of the glue that my dwell time on trying to remove it was too long and the heat from that long duration caused the capacitor to explode. I mean, you can see that the base of the capacitor is still glued to the motherboard. So if you have any tips for removing caps that are glued, let me know down below in the comments. And here's a closer look at the aftermath. Definitely take a lesson from me and ensure that your dwell time on these caps when using hot tweezers or even hot air isn't too long. And this is just another reason why you should always wear eye protection when modding and refurbing consoles. Anyway, since many of these caps are glued down, I decided to use the trimming method since I've always had good luck with it and these pads seem to be in very good condition. So I'm gonna go ahead and do just that. Now, another interesting tidbit of information regarding the Pac-N1 is its ability to utilize the LaserDisc format. There are in fact 14 games solely developed for the Laser Active with the Pac-N1. Now, none of these titles aren't really anything to write home about and primarily consist of FMV type games, but I still think it's pretty neat that there were games developed for this really unique format. And one other piece of trivia has to do with the name of these modules. The one that I'm working on, as I've mentioned throughout the video, is the Pac-N1. From this designation, we can determine the games it can play, as well as the region. 
The N stands for NEC, or Nippon Electric Company, the firm responsible for the creation of the PC Engine and Turbo Graphics here in North America. And the 1 is the region designation, in this case, Japan. So as you may be able to surmise, the Packin 1 is a Japanese PC Engine. To designate the North American region, Pioneer added a zero to the product number, making it the Pack N10. So by extension, this also applies to the Sega Pack. Like I mentioned earlier in the video, I also refurbished a Sega Genesis Pack called the Pack S10. Since it had a zero at the end, it was a North American model. The Japanese equivalent for that Sega module is called the Pack S1. Anyway, this is just for those that are curious about the naming convention of these units and what their differences are. Okay, so we removed all the capacitors, and it's around 40 in total, so it's not a small job. And as a result, you should be left with a board with a bunch of shiny pads to solder our brand new capacitors to. Anyway, now let's go ahead and solder in our brand new capacitors. Since the caps are packed very close to each other in some areas, you'll want to start from the center and work your way out. The first capacitor that you should solder in is C364, as recommended by Zaxor, since this is at the center of a large cluster of capacitors. Now the way that I like to solder these surface mounted caps in is by first tinning one of the two pads, only adding a small amount of solder. Then I place the cap onto the pads, ensuring that the polarity is correct and that it's aligned properly. Please note that the negative side of the cap is indicated with this black marking here. Once aligned, I hold it firmly with either my finger or some tweezers, and then tack it in place with my iron. Then on the other side, we can fully solder in the lead, and then add a bit more solder back to the original side that we tacked in. This should leave us with a capacitor that is solidly installed onto the motherboard. Now, all you need to do is rinse and repeat about 40 more times. Console 5's wiki page provides a fantastic mapping of where all the capacitors go, including their values, so I definitely recommend using that as a reference. Phew, that was a pretty big job, but now we have a clean and fully recapped pack in one board. But there is one more thing we need to do. On the bottom of the board, near the 6260 chip, we'll replace two ceramic capacitors at C529 and C526 with those that came in our console 5 capacitor kit. This is what's called the jailbar fix, and yes, even the expensive pack in one suffers from jailbarring issues. So let's go ahead and replace these caps real quick.
Now, one thing that I should have replaced while in here is the internal battery, which I believe is for providing power to the volatile memory for storing saved game data. It's a through-hole component and is fairly easy to replace, so if you're refurbishing an N1 like this, I strongly recommend getting a replacement. Now, all that's left is putting the pack n one back together. And there you have it folks, a rejuvenated and restored pack in one for the laser active. So with all the capacitors replaced, let's go ahead and see if we can actually use the pack in one to play some PC Engine games. And if we turn it on, sure enough, we're able to load a Hue card, which is just fantastic news. Now, what's really awesome and unique about this system is we can leverage the laser active CD functionality to play Super CD-ROM games. As you can see, they also boot right up. Now, like I mentioned previously, there's also what are called LD-ROM games that are unique to the laser active, but I unfortunately don't have any to show you. They're basically PC Engine games that utilize the insanely large laser disc format. I have some Mega LD games that work with the Sega Genesis Pack S10, so just imagine something like this, but for the PC Engine. And for those that are curious, you can also get the Turbo EverDrive to fit, but you do need to remove the circuitry cover to get it thin enough so that it can be inserted into the Pack N1. Anyway, there you have it folks, a fully restored and serviced Pack N1. I hope this video gave you some valuable tips on not only how to restore the Pioneer Pack N1, but also several different ways to replace surface mounted capacitors, which is a very useful skill to have in your retro restoration arsenal. Now, if you have any questions or tips of your own that you'd like to share with the community, definitely drop them down below in the comments. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, I really appreciate you hitting that like button. Also, check out the video recommendation on screen for some great modding videos that I'm sure you'll enjoy. As always, thank you all so much for tuning in today, and I'll catch you again next time.